Hello, this video is section 4.1 from the Larson book, the probability distribution for a discrete variable. Now the first definition we're going to look at, a random variable, it must represent a numerical value associated with each outcome of a probability experiment. So they can't be categorical word responses, they have to be numerical. And there's two primary types of discrete and continuous random they're discrete and continuous. And let's define what each of those are. All right. Discrete is a finite or countable number of possible outcomes. Now, anything that this is the, if it starts out the number of something, for sure it'll be discrete. But it can be, you know, discrete that uh, anything where it only takes, and we'll see some, you know, monetary type of problems later where let's say, you're in whatever investing in something or gambling or whatever, you can either lose ten dollars or win twenty dollars. Uh, that would that would be discrete. They wouldn't be countable, but it, it would only be specific outcomes, not a range of values. And that's what uh, continuous is. Continuous is an infinite number of range outcomes that you could represent uh, on an interval on a number line. Measurements like time, height volume, temp, you know, even, even if whatever the display is showing you the measurement is, even if it shows it only in whole numbers, it doesn't mean that it can't take on values in those intervals. I see there's always like, you know, I'll just put a example of an interval here. So let's say we got like two to six. You know, an algebra and interval notation that means any possible real number between 2 and 6. So, you know, 3.5792, something like that. Uh, one more quick example I'll give you. If any of those are going to be just, uh, continuous, I, I usually have one question on a test where it gives you a variable. We're, we're going to look at some examples and then ask you whether it's discrete or continuous. So let's say you've got a, a, like a 16-ounce bottle of something to drink, water, soda, whatever. Well, Technically, you know, especially if you have the you know, more sophisticated measuring devices, but even then, the the, the uh, amount of volume in that bottle can be anywhere from zero to sixteen, any real number. I mean, theoretically, it could have eleven point five three seven ounces in it, if you had the white you know ability to measure it to that fine of a detail. But it's not just whole number of amounts. In other words, it's not either well you've got zero or you've got one ounce or you've got two or you've got three. That's not right. Anything between 0 and 16 would be um, possible. So let's look at a few of these. Look at some of these. So number of goals scored in a soccer game, that would be discrete. Like I said, the number of anything is discrete. Number of home runs in a baseball game is discrete. Um, and you don't have to even know how many there are going to be. In other words, if, if before like a baseball game even starts, it could be... You don't have to have a stopping point, in other words, but you know it's going to be either zero or one or two or three or whatever. It's not going to be 1.57 home runs hit in a game. The time it takes to complete a baseball game, that would be continuous. Time is going to be continuous. The number of defects found on an automobile inspection, final inspection, that's discrete because if you're just counting the number of defects, it's going to be countable numbers. The temperature of a pizza oven at a particular time, and once again, ignoring you know displays are only going to show you, you know, whole number temperatures. But obviously, temperature does not have to be a whole number. It could it could be in intervals between whole numbers. Um, the amount won or lost based on a five dollar even money roulette bet. You're either going to lose five or you're going to win five. So that would actually be discrete. It's not countable, but means it only has those two outcomes. And I've already talked about this one, the liquid in the bottle, but that would be continuous. And the number of questions answered correctly on a multiple choice exam with 20 questions, that would be discrete. It's perfectly countable. Let's talk about a discrete probability distribution. A discrete distribution with random variable X, sometimes you might see things where they throw in other variables like Z or something like that, but it's 
it doesn't have to be X, but I think it's, it's good form if we use X. But don't panic if you saw a chart that had Z there or something. So discrete probability distribution, what it is, it lists all the possible values of X, and then you, you write right below it or beside it if it's vertical. Sometimes these are vertically or horizontal. Um, I, I do them usually in the notes, horizontal. When we look at um, uh, my stat lab problems, you may see them vertically. I just do them horizontally just to kind of save space on the page. So either you write the probability either below the X or next to the X if it's vertical. And you'll see that. So let's look at one uh, example here. Let's say we uh, X has to be numerical, so we roll a single die and let X be the number of dots facing up. So you see here I've listed the values of X would be, all possible values of X would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And then the probability of each individual number would be 1 out of 6. So each of these probabilities would be 1 out of 6. Now, don't make the assumption that every time you do a distribution, the probabilities are all going to be the same. That's not true. But it, it is in this example. Um, anyway, now, the uh, any valid discrete probability distribution must satisfy the following two conditions. Now, number two will be something we haven't looked at until now, but we've definitely talked about the first one in Chapter 3, uh, the, the probability of any value has to be between 0 and 1. So we already know that. But now, this one says the sum of your probabilities and your distribution must add up to exactly 1, meaning you've got a 100% chance that one of those is going to occur. One, like this one be rolling a 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or 6. So they have to add up to 1. So no, adding up to one doesn't mean it's right, but they, if they don't add up to one, then you know it's wrong. Now let's look and see if these distributions, if we think they might be valid by that definition. Now the, the values of X do not matter. That's not important. So you say, don't, don't, don't let that negative X. Yeah, those X's can be anything. We're just looking at the probabilities. So we have four probabilities. Individually, they're all fine. They're all between zero and one. That's, that part's good. But when you add them up, which I did here in the calculator, they add up to 1.1, which is not equal to 1. Therefore, that probability distribution is not valid, not, not possible. The next one, each individual probability looks good. They add up to 1 exactly, so that's a valid distribution. Now the next one, uh, we have a negative probability in there, so that's, that's it. That makes it not valid. On purpose, though, I did make them add up to one just in case. You know, I, I made them add up to exactly one, which so it satisfied that part of the, of the process. But um, but no, it, it it can't have a negative probability, so that one's not valid. All right, so that's not too bad. Now this next this one's not too bad either. All right, so if you have one missing value, in this case, like right there. And you know the other values? Could you figure out what that value would be? Absolutely, because we know they have to add up to 1. So all you have to do is take 1 minus the sum of the other 3. Now I just put it in parentheses right here. You can add them up first if you want to, and then just go 1 minus that number. Whatever you do, then do it correctly, you'll end up with 0.16. Obviously, you can double check that and then add 4 of them and see that it, add all 4 of them and see if it adds up to 1. All right. Now let's take a look at these questions. I like to put at least one of these on a test, maybe two, but maybe only one. Um, find here, so here's our distribution. I went ahead and just show. Yeah, if, uh, given a question like this, and if they're not asking if it's valid or not, unless it's a mistake, but you know, that shouldn't be the case. It should be valid, but I just made a note of it over here that it was. So. You know, anytime they give you one, it, sh it shouldn't, it's not, the idea is not to, not to trick you and give you an invalid distribution. So we want to solve these probabilities based on these distributions. So now you've got to be real careful with reading your inequality symbols from back from algebra. You know, it's got the bar below it. That means equal. So um, this is saying X between 1 and 3. 
And if you've got to equal at both of those, that means you include 3 and you include 1. So all the x's between one, uh, 1 and 3 would be 1, 2, 3. So the probability would be these three probabilities added together. And we get 0.61. Now the next one has an equal at 1, but it does not at 3. So that means we include 1, but we don't include 3. So it's just 1 plus 2. So we add these two numbers together and get 0.29. Now the next one is between 1 and 4 and doesn't have an equal at either end, so we don't include 1 and we don't include 4, so that would just leave 2 and 3. So we add up the probabilities for 2 and 3 and get 0 0.40. Um, less than or equal to 3, that's different than less than or 3, less, uh, less than 3, less than or equal to 3, we include 3, 2, 1, all of those, we add those 3 up and we get 0.61. The next one's greater than 3. Obviously, that's different than greater than or equal to 3, which would include the 3. But strictly greater than 3 would only be the 4 and the 5. So we add those two up. And greater than 5, there are no x's greater than 5. That would be 0. Less than 6, they're all less than 6. Add them all up. That probability will be 1. All right, let's uh, flip a coin twice here. Uh, I just list, I mean, you could use a tree to get these values if you need to, or with two coins, you probably could just list them out easily enough. But the possibilities are head, then head, head, tail, tail, head, tail, tail. So you may be thinking, hey, didn't, you know, thinking towards me, didn't you, didn't you tell me that, um, that X has to be a, Numerical, the random variable has to be numerical. That's correct. These are not numerical. So X has to be defined from this experiment in a way that would make it numerical. And here's what we came up with this one. You could do tails or heads. So let X be the random variable that counts the number of tails that appears in both tosses. So you now see now, even though we're dealing with heads and tails, we're going to have... Um, a numerical outcome. And before I scroll down, let's see what that's going to be. Okay. We, um, if we flip a coin twice and we're counting how many tails, we can get no tails, zero. If we do it and count number of tails, it's possible to get one tail. And then it's possible to get two tails. So the only possible outcomes here are 0, 1, and 2. If you flip a coin twice, or both at the same time, and you're counting the number of tails, the only answers you can get are 0, 1, and 2. There's no other answer you can possibly get. You would have to flip the coin you know, more times to get more answers. So we know these are the x's here, 0, 1, and 2. Now, let's get the probabilities. So you go back up here to the sample space, and you see there are four, four outcomes here. Now, the number of outcomes that represent zero tails would be the heads right here, the first one. So you've got a one out of four chance of that happening. The probability of getting exactly one tail, well, there's two ways you can do that. It could be head then tail, tail then head. So you've got a two out of four chance of that. And the last one, the probability of getting exactly two tails would be one out of four. So you see that, okay, that the, each probability is fine, and they, then they add up to exactly one, which is good. But like I was saying earlier, adding up to one doesn't mean it's right. Because, for example, if you just wrote down there one-third, 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 that would add up to one, but it wouldn't be correct. But the important thing is not adding up to one means we have a mistake for sure. So, you know, for example, let's say if you would have wrote one-fourth, two-fourth, two-fourth. And you, then you double-check and go, hey, that adds up to five over four, so I know th something's not right here. And then you can fix it. Excellent. Now, let's say we're going to take some ping-pong balls and maybe get a Sharpie. And write some numbers on them, one, two, or three. And let's say we write them down in um, this fashion. 
decide I, I wrote uh, two ones, three twos, and five threes. Now, I wrote the frequency distribution over here just to show you. We don't really, really need that. This will be the actual probability distribution, So, uh, which is which is the frequency distribution, relative frequency, but then divided by the, the total to make it relative frequency, which is our probability. So essentially, you got 10 balls. So you, gotta, you pull one out, and, and what's the probability you get each of these? Well, there's two ones, so you got a two out of ten chance of getting uh, a one. For the twos, three out of ten chance. For the threes, five out of ten chance. And my probabilities do add up to one, so that's good. Now let's talk about the, the, the mean of a discrete distribution, the average. It's pretty easy to calculate. Um, and this... Uh, Basically, it's the average of the variables. They're kind of like a weighted mean, you know, we've talked about before, sort of like that. It is, it is a weighted mean. Um, anyway, but it also represents, it, was, it would represent the um, theoretical average. Like if you repeated this experiment over, you know, according to the law, law of large numbers, over and over and over and over, and, and, and we were recording each number we got, whether it was one, two, or three, you would expect the average to be somewhere near that particular value. So here's what you do. It's not too bad. You just take each x and multiply it by its respective probability. And then you move over. So you go like this x times p for the first one. Move over, x times p. Move over, x times p. And then you add those up. So here, come down here. We'll see how this example goes. Um, and... We have 1 over 1 times 2 over 10, plus 2 times 3 over 10, plus 3 times 5 over 10. And in the average would be 2.3. The mean would be 2.3. Now, this book doesn't necessarily use the, this term EMV, a more expected values, more accurate term. I'm going to leave that EM. That's not going to really cause you any grief, I don't think. So. That term is from another book, but it, it's the mean, but when we talk about this EMV, or more specifically EV, I'm almost tempted to change these to EV, because expected value is kind of what we're used, usually used to using. Um, let's see. So I may just say EV, even though it says EMV. But this is when you kind of have monetary outcomes in, involved in the problem money loss and, and our random variable x is going to be the net gain or loss per a certain situation okay. now this example says we have a short-term business venture um, that has a probability of 1 over 10 of profiting 12,000, a probability of 4 over 10 that we break even, and a probability of 5 out of 10 of losing 3,000. What is the expected value of this adventure? So there's three outcomes. Break even means, you know, zero. We're looking at it as profit, loss, 12,000. We win 12,000. Break even, zero. Now, here's where you got to be careful. If you remember this, then you'll have no trouble if you don't make this mistake. Even though you don't see a negative sign in the problem, there's no negative on the number, losing $3,000 makes it negative. So the word losing makes that a negative 3,000. So if you're careful there, you're great. So we got 1 out of 10 for the probability of winning 12,000, 4 out of 10 break even, 5 out of 10 of losing 3,000. So you just do the calculation, x times p, x times p, x times p, and... That comes out to be negative 300. Okay, now, so what, what that basically means is, because you're not going to lose, you know, negative 300 on any one, one outcome, but that means that if you did this experiment over and over and over, and that's what I'm editing right here, I'm making it a little smaller, you should, on average, you'll lose $300 each on average, and that's no good. So you do a lot of times, that's going to be a lot of money. So that's not really a really a good uh, business venture there for us. I mean, yeah, you could get lucky the one time and quit, first time and quit maybe, but 
yeah, this came came from another book here. It's kind of interesting because it's, you know, what a, <laughs> there's no real definition here of what uh, no oil, some oil, much oil means, but that doesn't affect the, the problem, so it's not that big a deal. Uh, but uh, So some oil drilling experiment. Minus 40,000. If we get we lose 40,000, if, uh, if it was no oil, we've got a 0.25 probability of that happening. Whatever some oil means, we'll profit 10,000. We have a 70% chance of that happening. And much oil will profit 70,000 with a 0.05 probability of doing that. And I'm just making note here that the probabilities do add up to one. And then we just do the XP. So these first two, next two, next two add them up and we get positive 500 so that means in theory we should average $500 profit per attempt all right okay a roulette wheel Roulette wheel has 38 equally spaced numbers. Well, there are some wheels with 39 numbers, but we're not getting into that in our class. This, this, this is fine. Eight and 37 even is also. 18 red, 18 black, and 2 green. And let's say, uh, so you, obviously you, you needed uh, with this, this breakdown right here is, is sufficient enough for you to figure out these probabilities. Now, um, you don't have to have a knowledge of gambling here or whatever, but we're going to walk up. We're going to bet five dollars on black, and what's going to happen here? It's called an even money bet because that means you're either going to lose five dollars or you're going to win five dollars. So if you, you know, if you have a five dollar chip out there, they're going to add another five dollar chip out there. That doesn't mean you won ten dollars. It means there's ten dollars in front of you, but you only, you know, you gained five dollars. So there's two outcomes. Lose five or win five. Negative five, positive five. So we lose five. We're betting on black. So there's uh, 38 numbers total. We got 18 blacks working for us. But we have 18 red and two green working against us. So it's um, 20 over 38 working against us. Then the black, 18 out of 38 working for us. You see, I just made a note here that the probabilities do add up to one. Yeah, that would be in case you accidentally wrote 18 over 38 and 18 over 38 and forgot about the greens. And then you would add it up and go, hey, that's 36 over 38. No good. So to calculate this, not too difficult. Um, negative 5 times 20 over 38 plus 5 times 18 over 38. Negative 0.263. So what that means is that on average you would lose about 26 cents on average per bet on a five dollar bet. So that's that's the casinos looking at it. So you don't want to become a professional roulette player, but if you're just, you know, at a casino gambling, having fun, bringing cocktails to you and whatnot, you know, I'm not saying don't play it, just don't play it as a profession because you're going to lose. So they're taking 26 cents on average out of every $5. So the, the, the house, the casino is looking at it from uh, from all players, they're not looking at you specifically. They're looking at how much are they bringing in and to convert this to a percentage, which I would never ask you to do this, but... If you take that number and divide it by five, that gives you the, the advantage that they, they have a 5.26% mathematical advantage on the game roulette. They don't have to do anything to try to cheat the game or anything like that. The long-term mathematical expected value will work in their advantage. Wonderful. All right, so here's one that says... Uh, Car wash loses $30 on a rainy day, so you see loses is negative 30, makes 120 on days, makes profits 120 when it doesn't rain, plus 120. 
If the probability of rain is 0.15, calculate the car, car wash's expected profit. Now notice only gives us one probability here. It didn't, it didn't give us both probabilities. That, okay, that's the key here is that if there's only two outcomes, it only has to give us one. It could give us both. Like if there were three or more outcomes, you couldn't get by with just one of these. But remember the idea of a complement that we've learned before. If the probability of rain is 0.15, then the probability of not rain is 1 minus 0.15. So you see they didn't give us that number, but it was super easy to come up with. So then once you have that, you can do the calculation, negative 30 times 0.15, 120 times 0.85, and we have 97.50. So they should average profit of 97.50 per day. All right, let's look at, all right, I'm going to skip through some of this because you're not going to have to use these formulas. Well, we sort of have to in Excel. This one, right, this We'll be using this one if you want to use Excel. If you use the calculator, you don't have to worry about the formula. But I might just show you one real quick. The variance, of course, standard deviation. Standard deviation is always square root of the variance. Always. No matter what kind of variance formula you are given, the standard deviation will absolutely be the square root of that. And this is only population. There's no sample here because when you do a probability distribution, that is the distribution of all, the population of all the Xs. There is no sample. In fact, when I show you in the calculator, it, it, it um, you know, back to what we did before, it always showed you a, an SX and a Sigma X. It showed you both. Uh, here, I won't even show you the SX. So what this says is, you know, you, you get the mean from right here. We've already seen that. You take the X times P of X, you add those up, and then you, you create a square of the X's, an X squared. Multiply that times the probability, add those up, then subtract whatever this number is squared. So like I said, you're not going to have to, but let me just show you kind of quickly how it works on this one. Um, so this here was, a, here was a distribution. In fact, did I? Oh, I have this in Excel. Okay, now I'll, we'll do this in Excel for a, a new example here in a little bit, but I can explain what's going on right here in the meantime for this one. And the same thing with calculator. I'll show you new examples there. Let's see what we got here. So, okay, XP, XP, XP. I went ahead and created an X squared row here because I'm going to need that in the next step. So XP, 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 8.4. There's your mean, 8.4. I like this formula, top formula, better, and that's the way I did it in Excel too. So now I'm creating um, an X squared P thing here. So you see the X squared P's are next to each other. 4 times 0.12, 25 times 0.28, so forth, so on. You add those up, but that's not the answer for the variance. You do add those up, but you see right here, though, at the end, you subtract the square of that mean. So you subtract 8.4 squared at the mean. Um, back in the old days, when people, as people were using technology more and whatever, and well, they were using calculators, but they were uh, doing the formula they would often forget to subtract this part right here and just add those up. So your variance is 18.12 and your standard deviation is the square root of that. So it's rounded to 4.26. So like I say, you're going to watch me work through this in a little bit. So it's basically, you get your data in there. You want your X's in L1 and you want your P's in L2. And now though, this is a little bit different. When we were doing these calculations in our, the earlier chapters, you know, we only had one one column of data. So we weren't using this space right here, right below the lit, right there, where it says frequency list. We didn't have anything there. That was blank. Now, though, you have to put L2 in there. And I'll show you how to do that, but you just basically go um, L2 is this blue one right here above 2. You go alpha L2 like that. So you need this here. But then one thing to keep in mind, if you're, if you're going back, you know, to do statistics on 
one sample data again and you, and you want to perform the one far stats, then you'll need to know to remove that L2. You need to get rid of it when there's only one column of data. You need it there when it's two. So like I was telling you, it doesn't even give you the SX. It gives you the mean right there. So you can get the mean right here and see it's giving you the, the standard deviation right here, 4.26. Now the same issue uh, comes up here as it did before. You don't get variance from the calculator. Uh, it only gives you standard deviation. That's not a big deal. You have to just you just take in this number, and this I'll, I'll show you this in the calculator. I won't. Uh, I'll just, okay, I'll just use 4.26. Maybe to be accurate on a test, it wouldn't matter. But my math lab, you might want to give it a few more. Well, I guess since I'm looking right at, it, I'll put a few more decimals in there. I'll go. Sometimes I'm just paranoid about what the uh, my math lab's going to want. That's good, 676. And I'll square it, which is right there. So there's your 18.12. So that's not a big deal. I don't think that's a big problem to do that, to take that number and, and square it. But let me show you what you got to do in Excel. I'm going to tell you, I, I personally have a preference for the calculator on this one. Uh, but but once again, I've, I've mentioned many times before, it's uh, you can you know use whichever whatever you want, you know whichever way you want to do it. But I think that's and I've also mentioned the beauty of this is the flexibility of you can change, you know, oh I like calculator for this one, oh I like Excel for this one, other thing, you know, so you you don't have to stick to one. But there is no command like there is in the TI calculator. I had to create a formula. So here's the X, here's the PX. And this third column is X times PX, which you can see A2, you know, A2, A3, they're all multiplied. And then I use the sum command to add those up. Which yeah, I, now I'll do it in a real live example here in a minute, but I, I probably summed it by dragging the columns and hitting that summation key, you know, like that. You can either type in the formula like that or use that little zigzag thing right there. Um, and I got the mean, 8.4. So you see, I used the mean right here just, just to reference this cell right here. Now, this column, I went ahead, I didn't create a separate x squared column. I just squared it right here in the formula. I created the x squared px. So you see over here, I'm squaring it right here in the formula, a2 squared times b2. So there's x squared times p, x squared times p, so forth. I added those up. Now, the variance will be the sum of these which you see I have right here is D7 minus the square of the mean, which is right here above it in C7. So it's D7 minus C7 squared. And standard deviation, I just did, you know, square root of, oh, looks like I did it from over here. I could have done it right there. That, well, it's, I guess it's the same, the same cell, same thing, yeah. It's a square root of that number, and there's 4.2567. Now, the one disadvantage of this, I mean, I, is you know, you're going to have to change your formula up a little bit. You, I guess you could probably, if you let's say you're going to do one with more data, actually, I guess you probably could just insert some rows, and I think the formula would adjust itself correctly. Yeah, you could do that. You just insert some rows, and that should probably be okay without having to, you may have to drag the formula down or something. I don't know. But anyway, there's, so there's not a real uh, nice way specifically to do it in Excel. It does involve using the formula. So here's another one. Did I do this one? I didn't even do this one in Excel. Um, I guess I could. Here it looks like I used the formula, which is not required. Um, so here's the distribution. So I'm just... I could probably get rid of that, but just now I've told you verbally, don't worry about it. So sigma squared was XP, 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 XP minus the square of the mean, which is 
Um, okay, using the other formula, forget that. Don't worry about that either. Okay, here's one of our stats. I'll put this one in here. I want to be able to see that, see everything. One of our stats. L1. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Got to enter the data first. Excuse me. Stat edit to get the list in there. So it's... um. Okay, get that junk out of my way. So I'm going to go up here and I'll clear the list. Clear, arrow down. One, two, three, four. And then point one. Point five. Point two. Oh, oh. Enter. Point two, then enter. Point two, then enter. So I can quit out of that. I go stat, calc, one bar of stats. Now I got to go second, two right there brings up L2. So I got to have the L2 in there. And then you can see everything here is right there. Uh, I can't stop. I'm going to wait to the homework here and just show you the Excel. Yeah, I think I'll just, I'll just, I mean, you can try this one yourself if you want to, but I'll just wait till we get to the homework and I'll show you a couple in Excel there. So, okay, everybody, let's do some homework. I want to start with problem number two in this section. Compute the mean number of accidents per day. I'm going to show you this in the calculator and then we'll take a look at this in Excel. In the calculator, we go stat, edit, list. I'm going to clear all these out by going up here at the top, hit clear, nothing happens, but you move the arrow, they go away. It's weird. I'm going to put all the X's in L1. X's must go in L1, and the probabilities must go in uh, L2. Go over to L2.31. It'll be an interesting decision choice for you. You know, if you, well, I guess if you always, you know, if you never use a calculator, I guess it's not much of a choice. But you'll see when we do this, you might, might need to make a decision on which method you prefer better. But maybe not. If you're just going to stick to one way, that's fine, too. Okay, so I quit out of this. And it goes stat, calc, one of our stats. Now, when we're dealing with one set of data like we have before, you only need that L1. Here, you have to go second, the number two, to bring up L2. But then, if you're a calculator user a lot, you got to remember if you want to like, go back, we do something later, if you're going back to do old homework, or more specifically, when the final exam comes around, and you're not dealing with two columns of data like this, you'll have to get rid of that, change that frequency list, get rid of it, get rid of that L2. You only use that L2 for these kind of problems. Oh, and, and linear regression. You, X's and Y's and linear regression would use both of these. That one I think most people will probably do with Excel, or did with Excel when we covered it. But I just want to mention it anyway. So here it gives you the mean right there at the top. I know it's using X bar. Don't worry about that. That's still the same thing as the mu. So 1.48. Now I'm going to go ahead and do this. I'm going to get these answers even before. I, I want to do this 
whole process before I go to Excel. You already know what the answers are. Standard deviation right there uh, wants three decimal places. 1.533. Now one thing I'm going I to mention about the calculator before I leave it. Uh, well, I'll, I'll mention it right now before I answer this question. And one thing the calculator doesn't show is variance. If it wanted to know variance, you would just take that to see to go from variance to standard deviation at square root. But to go from square root to, to standard deviation to variance, you square it. So you would just have to type in 1.533x squared. And that gives you the variance. And we'll, let's remember that number. Well, I'll, I can bring it right back up as I'm not doing anything else here. Part C, find the probability there will be at least two accidents per day. So all we have to do is add up all the probabilities that satisfy that criteria. X greater than or equal to 2. So I start at 2. I'm not going to type these in the calculator, but I'm just showing you right here. 0.14, add these down. I'll save us a little time, so hopefully I won't do it wrong, but that's just a matter of you adding those five up in the calculator. 1, 4, 9, 7, 4, and 2, 23, 30, 0.36. But you should use a calculator. <laughs> All right. Now, before I go to the next question, I'm going to stay here, though, and show you in Excel. Now, Excel does not have a fancy... program or command like the, the calculator did so you gotta uh, I'm gonna download the data here I basically wrote a little program like I showed in the notes the note shows so this is just sort of a version of that I think actually in the notes I'll put the you know, the actual commands there I need to check and see if they're there or not the formula text next to them but let's go to where I've done this already and oh, oh I got too many files open I don't know what's what here all right there it is so I have an x a px I need an xpx and an x squared px because the mean will be the sum of the uh, xpx and the, the variance will be the sum of the x squared px's minus the mean squared. In fact, let me put these over here at least anyway. So you can see those formulas. Formula text G3. drag these down I think I made a mistake here yes I did I did this all right these two let me cut paste these here they're not gonna be the right formula now though I'll have to change them I go there, still are. And this is just the sum of the C3 column. Oh, okay, there it is. I wonder, well, there it was right, but all right. I'm a, oh, I must have referenced the wrong cell when I typed in formula text. Oh, I said G2 and not G3. That's right. Now it's all fixed. And the variance is the sum of that D column minus the square of the actual mean you get from here. And, of course, standard deviation is always the square root of variance. So, now one thing about this spreadsheet, though, I get, if you need to, you know, obviously change the size of it, you'll have to delete rows and stuff or add rows and then make sure your formulas reference it. Now, I believe, uh, if I'm correct, that... You know, you can't, let's say you, you do a problem and the next problem has more data. I don't think you can add numbers to the end of it, but if you actually insert 
some rows in there. If you insert it, the formula will adjust. Let me, let me, we can watch the formula. Let's try that. And that way, if you insert a bunch of rows, then you can always delete off what you don't at the end. It should retain the formula. And I'm going to insert here a row. Yeah, you see that? It moved them over. It moved it down one. So if you insert, and if you do accidentally insert too much, you can cut off the bottom. But um, but you couldn't just randomly type in a new cell here at the bottom. Like, watch what happens. If I just put in something like zero, you see the formula didn't change. It needs to be uh, inserted from within there. So let's see what we got. I need. I'll copy the X's. And put them here. So I need to delete a row on this because I only want to go to only want to go to nine. So it adjusted it over, and now I got a copy in the uh, formula here. It's probably going to need to be extended down one two. Drag that corner and bring the formula down. There we go. And then the P's are right here. I guess I should have copied them. I should have copied them all at the same time since I had it. All right, my okay, that was my well, could have done that a little more efficiently. Wait, what? Okay, there we go. So let's see. 1.48 and 1.53, that sounds correct from what we got on the homework. Yep, there it is, 1.48, 1.533. Okay, so there's how, there's how we would do it in Excel. But you just have to, you know, write that formula out yourself and then, you know, adjust the rows as needed. Whereas the calculator, you don't have to do any of that. You just get the, get the one column, get the other column, it'll figure it out from there. Now we'll go to the next question. Now, this one's a little stranger, these having frequencies. We're going to have to convert these frequencies to probabilities by dividing by the 200, but I'll show you how to do that. Now, the calculator, I don't think we have to do that. I'm going to check. I think it'll do it for us. So let me, uh, let me put them in there, and I'll... The answer, the number's got to be somewhere, you know, if you have anywhere between 0 and 8, the average has got to be somewhere, you know, between... So I know the answer's got to be between 0 and 8. So if I got some really large answer, I'd know it was wrong. Well, this one, I don't have to delete these numbers. So really, I just already have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So add a 7, add an 8. But I need a whole new left column there. So I'm going to put these whole numbers in there. But the way I did it in Excel, though, it, it will, it's not... Um, I, there's a couple different ways we can do it, but my, my formula is built for probabilities. This one will convert it. I think. 42. 34. 22. 15. Seven, three, one, uh oh. Where did I go wrong here? I can't have one one more in one column than the other. Oh, oh, good grief, they're all wrong. Crud. I didn't start the start at one. Sorry, I'll pause for a minute. All right, I'm back. I don't want you to watch me type all that in again. So now I've got, I should have the right column okay now. And now we can quit out of this. And go to stat, calc, one bar stats. Everything's good there. And okay, that means 2.35, which means that's a reasonable number. So, in fact, I'm going I'm to gamble. I'm going to put that right in there.
Now this one, because the calculator, if you only put probabilities in there, it knows it's a probability distribution. So it's only going to show, it won't even show you the S of X. I didn't mention that last time, but the S of X was zero. You can obviously scroll back in the video and look at that. It was nothing there because it knows we only wanted this, the population, but we still only want the population anyway. So we, we want, we want the, the sigma X number. The SX will not, but that's the reason why is because it was confused because there were frequencies there. So 1.746 should be right. All right. All right, I might as well do this real quick. Uh, prob so once again, it's probability less than two. That means one and zero. So obviously these two answers added together won't be right by themselves. 50 plus 26 is 76, but that's when you have, you have to divide by 200. If they were already probabilities, then they would not ha you would not have to divide. Because probabilities must be between zero and one. I'm going to go with 0.38. Look at us go. I'm going to leave this here without going to the next question. Because uh, now I'm going to come over and adjust my, got to adjust my little formula here. Now we know, I'm going to come up here, I'm going to insert two, uh, two more rows. Because now we know we have 0 through 8. Uh, let's see a couple ways I can do this. I think it's I haven't down, downloaded that one yet. How about now? Let me just get rid of this. Getting too many files open. It's confusing. Let's uh, let's download this. And okay, I was wondering what's going to happen. Now over here. Because my thing needs probabilities, I need to make these all probabilities right now. So to do that, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to say equal um, this B2 divided by 200. And I'm, going to, I'm converting the probabilities. I'm going to drag that down all the way like this. So I'm going to copy the 0 through 8. Paste it right there. Now this one, when I copy these, I don't want to do a direct paste because that's a formula. I don't think this is going to work. Might, but I'm going to go copy. But what will work, I know for sure, is if I go paste values, where it just takes the value right here from it and not the formula. And then it'll work perfectly. Okay, you probably knew that. That's all right. Okay, you see I'm missing a couple cell. I got to drag that down. No problem. Grab the corner and drag it like that. So how does that look over there? 2.35 and 1.746. Sounds familiar. 2.35. 1.746. Beautiful. Now this one's a little tricky because of the way they ask the question. Well, two things that are tricky about it. I don't like a couple things about this. Very first time I did this problem, I, I messed it up and I caught it real quick. It's because they've got the probabilities over there to the left. But well, I, when I did it in the calculator, it messed me up. Because you can't put those, the probabilities have to go in the uh, second column. Now, and, and same thing with the Excel spreadsheet I have. They have to go in the second column. So once you kind of get this thing organized, it's not so bad. But then there's another part, the way they ask the questions I don't like. And I'll, I'll explain that to you here in a minute. Uh, we're going to get a list going. Okay, so I've got to clear this because I know I'm not going to have as many values this time. So L2, i got to put the probabilities over here in L2. 
you know, you can't just you can't put them in you can't put them in the first column. Sort of like my spreadsheet. You can't put them in the first column there either. So the good news is that column, those are the same probabilities for both stock X and stock Y. So now I gotta put in negative one one zero. Forty. 150, 210. All right, so far so good. Stat, calc, one bar stats. All right, there's the mean 103. But here's the issue. is It should be asking, the proper way to ask this would be to ask for the mean and standard deviation of stock X and then the mean and standard deviation for stock Y. It's not doing that. It's asking for the two means and the two standard deviations. So what that means is that... Um, you need to make note of the standard deviation value there. You can write this down, obviously, or I'm just going to sort of snip it and move it over to somewhere. I'll dump it on the spreadsheet or somewhere where you know where it is. That doesn't really relate to this problem, but I'm going to go ahead and just... I'll tell you where I'll do it. I'll put it over... Uh, where we're going to be using Excel right over over here. Yeah, that, that bugs me about that problem, but other than that, it's not that bad. So let's remember that. I mean, we'll keep that note of that. Let's check the 103. All right. Now it's going to ask for the Y. So to get the Y, you just change those X values. That's not, like I said, it's not, that's not too bad there. Oh, wait, no, 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 sorry. Didn't, I said change them, I didn't change them. So the Y values for the, the X, well, I say X, don't stock, it could have been stock A and stock B. Those are still the X values when you enter them in here, even though it says stock Y. It's not dependent upon those letters. Negative 50, 20, I'm entering that right column. 100. All right. Same probabilities. Calculate. Okay, well this one, I won't have to necessarily mark this one down because we'll be able to get the standard deviation. I can just go right, leave, right, stay on that calculator screen. So this one will be 75. Now it's asking standard deviation for stock X. That's the number I have saved over here. Of course, I should have seen two, two decimal places. Okay. That's why we had to make note of it to bring back later because that one's no longer in the calculator. But the new one is. Stock Y is. 94.35. And then now to get the Y, just bring the calculator screen back up again. And there it is, 67.27. So that, that was, I found that problem, other than that, this problem was fine, but I found that part a little bit annoying. Okay, let's see. You see stock X has the higher uh, expected value. 
103 versus 75 long run average, but it also has a higher standard deviation, which means that it'll go up and down more, more volatility. So that's probably, that's how you have to answer this question. As far as which one you choose, that would be up to you, but, but it's saying, you know, uh, okay, it looks like A is going to be it. Based on expected value only, you'd pick that for sure, but it has a larger standard deviation, resulting in higher risk, which should be taken into consideration. All right. So I can pop this in Excel real quick for the same problem. And let me... Uh, delete some rows and it should adjust my formula accordingly. Yep. And they were 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.2. And then the X's will be with negative 110, 40, 150, 210. 150 and 210. So it's kind of the same scenario, even if you do this in Excel. You're going to need to you're going to need to make note of that standard deviation. Uh, so there's 103, yeah, because it's going to go away when you type in the new numbers on top of it. So same scenario. So you'd have to make note of it, write it down, or copy it to another cell or something. So now you can see everything. I'll put it back over there. Those those match. Just want to make sure everything ma matches up okay. Negative 50. Um, 20. 100, 170, yeah, and there's the 75 and the 67.27 right there. So there's how we would do it in Excel. And okay, that, um, that concludes this section on the discrete probability distributions.